Hello and welcome to this new episode of the Off the Shelf podcast, a book podcast by the Conference Board. My name is JP Kuhlwein. I'm principal at Uber Brands Consulting, teach at Columbia University and relevant to this here, lead the Marketing Institute at the Conference Board. And today I will be talking to Ken Rusk, who is a construction business entrepreneur. He's a blue color coach and he has written a book entitled Blue Color Cash, a book about loving your work, securing your future, and finding happiness for life, and that without a college degree and doing blue color work. Among other things, we'll talk about the education, income, digital divide that we see in America today and elsewhere uh, between white and blue color workers and communities. But I think most importantly, we'll talk about untapped opportunities uh, in the blue color sector that Ken actually sees. Um, and Ken, I think Ken has a quite optimistic uh, message, as you'll see. Thanks, uh, Ken, for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Um, I guess I should have said happiness for life because you don't have student debt or you're not sitting in front of a computer screen all day. Um, uh, I'll, I'm sure we'll get to that. But uh, before we get into it, uh, where does this podcast find you today? Well, I live in a small town called Sylvania, which is just outside of Toledo, Ohio, on the Ohio-Michigan border. Excellent. And, and this is where your business is as well? It is, yes, that is a fact. Excellent. I've I've lived in Cincinnati, Ohio for a while, so I know the Midwest a little bit. Um, your book um, starts with you having a shovel in your hand, or rather there is an illustration of that in the inside cover, uh, and you talk about um, digging some ditches. Um, can you tell us about the significance of this creation story. It's kind of your founding myth um, and how that has led eventually to writing this book a little bit. Well, yes, you know, when I was 15 years old, I lived um, in a small town just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And my high school actually shared a fence with several businesses. And we would walk through that fence after school on our way to the local carryout. And I always passed this one particular building which always was really buzzing with energy and excitement. So I decided to go in there one day because I wanted a, a summertime job as, as most young, young uh, men would, would like to have. And I went in and, and uh, applied and they hired me to do what I've done for a long time, which is actually digging ditches. Uh, it's a foundation company and we drain water away from foundations. You know, basements get old as they, uh, they start to deteriorate as they get old and it's time to fix them up. So that was really my first job. And I, I hung around for quite a long period of time. Um, I, I just tried to learn everything that I could and get every promotion that I could. And that led me to where we are today with owning a couple of these uh, foundation companies here um, in the Midwest. And uh, it's, so we've gone from, from zero employees to 200 over that 30-year period of time. And it's it's been a great ride. It's been a great uh, uh, experience for me overall. And what what inspired you to write a book about blue color work? You know, it, it's interesting because whenever you're in position to hire a lot of people, especially people where it might be their first or second or third job, you end up becoming almost an involuntary life coach. You know, you help them with uh, some of their challenges like their first credit cards, their first checking account, their first 401k, um, their first car, their first department. And I noticed that as time went on, especially from, let's say, the mid 80s to now, it, it, the people that were coming in to apply were less and less prepared for the real world. And so the the coaching things that I was doing, the, the uh, methods that I was using were working very well. And um, it was actually my wife that said, you know, this information should probably be out there beyond the four walls of your company. So I just started taking down some notes and uh, three years later, here we are. 
I guess, I guess putting on my academic hat, the first question I should have asked you is, what do you actually understand by blue color? What should we all understand by blue color? What what makes the real difference versus, I guess, white color is the other descriptor? Well, at, at, at any time in the United States, there's about 165 million people working. And within that number, there's about 65 million or so, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that do something with their hands. Now, this can be construction trades, it can be service industry, it can be um, anything where people get involved in a trade or a skill or in service of others. So there, there's there's quite a, a large swath. I, I know sometimes we talk about, you know, um, the, the manufacturing industry as the bellwether for blue collar work, but that's really only ever been about 20% of the total. So there's quite a few people out there that are working Uh, blue collar jobs and 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 currently currently working them today and it's not necessarily about sweat and muscle when you say working with your hands right this could be work in a lab i would think or maybe in a warehouse or uh, other places where it's not necessarily as physically straining as digging ditches well and that's the best part about it in my research for this book, I came across some amazing people, uh, many of them women. I met a woman who is a welder, and uh, she's making an enormous amount of money in the welding industry right now because of the lack of supply and demand of workers. I've met uh, gals that uh, own gravel truck companies. Um, that's a pretty rough and tumble business. And uh, to have them break into that, that world, um, I think is just fantastic. I, I've met people who have built their own bakeries. And, um, and even YouTube influencers, um, all people that have decided that they were going to forego the normal education and jump into a blue collar field. Right. Now, you talk about normal education yourself and, you know, hearing about women getting into the gravel trucking business seems spectacular. I guess that is because everyone seems focused, everyone seems to believe and enroll in this understanding that your kids should go to college, they should get into a white collar job, they should kind of, you should lift yourself out of whatever, you know, uh, background or, or position socially your family had and, and, and go higher. And that being the American dream, just like owning your own house, your own car, having a credit card, and so on and so on. Do you disagree with that? Is becoming a blue collar worker an attractive alternative to this kind of uh, college and white collar dream? Well, let's let's back up just a second and talk about some of our youth coming up today. First off, for a, a lot of kids, they're, they grow up with cell phones and you know tablets in their hands, and they don't go outside and do things like build tree forts and you know, maybe bake things in the kitchen. And, you know, some of those, uh, some of those inert uh, type of um, vocations that we all kind of learned as we grew up. And it, that has created a, a whole supply and demand issue for people who would come up and attempt to take on some of those blue collar jobs. If you pair that problem up with the fact that we took shop class out of our high schools in the 80s, and replaced it with computers. Now, it was essential that we all learn how to use computers. I completely understand that. But I don't think it was a binary choice where it was one or the other. And when that happened, we eliminated whole generations of millions of kids who would have discovered how to weld, how to um, hammer and nails, how to um, do mechanics or um, plumbing or electrical. And that with combined with the way we're growing up these days is creating an ongoing and continuing and probably worsening supply of, uh, of, of workers to, to fill the jobs we need today. And whenever that happens, if you take supply and demand into account, you, if everyone is going towards the college route, you should probably be a contrarian thinker and go towards the blue collar route because that's where the supply is the lowest and the demand is currently the highest and that's where the money goes. Okay, so let's accept that blue color can be very attractive. Can you share with us two or three of the most important and maybe most distinct 
principles uh, uh, or, or success criteria to, to, to be successful in a blue collar environment? You say it can be very attractive. This can be where the demand is. I suspect that you nevertheless need to have a certain approach to be successful in the blue collar environment. Can you share some of those success principles with us? Well, in the book, I talk about persistence and resilience because, you know, blue collar work is tough, but the good news there is you control your own output. So you work as hard as you want to work. You and only you build or make or create what you want to do in a day. And when you do that, you can also control some of your uh, financial rewards from that. I think anyone who... um, who has the ability, and and this is something I wish we taught our kids a little better in high school. I think when you start out, instead of just coming out of high school and having someone hand you um, a machete and say, hey, there's the forest, start chopping with no idea where you're going, I think we need to better prepare our kids by teaching them how to visualize their futures. Teach them, you know, what do they want their future to look like one, three, five, ten years from now? What is your nirvana? What would be your really um, uh, complete comfort, peace, and freedom type of life. Because if I can be goal-oriented, then I become a much more effective individual. And once I see what I'm after in life, I think some of the stigma that's uh, assigned to some of these blue-collar jobs kind of disappears. You know, for me, ditch digging was probably 100th on a list of 100 things that I thought I would be doing. The problem is I started doing it and I was able to control my own income. I was able to gain the things I wanted to make my life work. So I stayed there because I was in control of that. So yes, persistence and resilience are are two things you really have to have. But I think vision is one of the best ones because what people don't realize is there is a lot of very lucrative work in blue collar fields that you can take advantage of. Now, Understand persistence, uh, endurance, uh, vision. They seem very related to what also people would be uh, recommended to do in, in white-collar jobs. Uh, grit, I think, is one favorite word going around uh, offices uh, in, the, in the past couple of, of months. Um, what about technical skills? Uh, you know, welding, you mentioned that earlier, is very different from computer programming. And it seems to me that while a lot of the white color work has very formal education, blue color work in the US at least seems to me much less organized. I come from Germany, as you might have detected by my accent. And I was flabbergasted when I arrived in the US for the first time that overnight somebody can decide to be a baker, to be a Uh, air conditioning installer to be a taxi driver, where in Germany that actually requires a specialized um, education and even a master certificate if you want to run a bakery, for example. What do you think about formal blue color education? Should it exist? If yes, how? Have you looked looked a little bit at other countries and systems that you like there? Well, first off, I really like um, the programs that you have in Germany. I, I was there a couple of years ago, and I, that, that is a one fantastic country. So <laughs> congratulations on being from there. But w- w- one of the things that I, I think is important to realize is, again, the, the stigmatization of blue-collar work has kind of stifled some of the education that you need in the United States. Now, there are technical schools you can go to. There are vocational schools you can go to. You can sign into a union and be an apprentice. Um, but I think one of the best ways, and this is the least, the least um, you know, the least technical or, or the least uh, um, complicated way, I guess, is to just go get a job in one of those fields. You know, somebody wrote a book a long time ago, which I quote in Blue Collar Cash, where we talk about the ability to master some, something in eight to 10,000 hours. Now, I know people try to debunk that theory um, and, and they relate that to, you know, professional sports players. But in this case, I actually think it works because because there is so little supply of these workers. When you do find one and you find find one that you really think is going to be good at um, at uh, what your job is, you tend to throw everything you have as a as a, a boss or a mentor at that individual. And I can tell you that 
in as little as if you think about full-time work as, you know, 2000 hours a year, it, it doesn't take very long, maybe two, three, four years before you get really good at that particular skill because you're actually involved in doing it. And unlike college, you're getting paid those four years to do that work. All right. Now, even in your book, um, you, you obviously are very proud of your own achievements. You talk about them as a learning point. Um, you now have Rusk Industries, you know, fast forwarding 30 years. I think you have over 100 employees. You say um, it's a multi-million dollar business. Um, you talk about vision and all of that. It seems that even there, even as you talk about blue color, the ultimate dream of the self-made entrepreneur who eventually becomes the big boss and makes a lot of money seems to be the ultimate dream. So I wonder whether it defeats this purpose of valuing blue color work. But before we get into that provocative statement for you, we'll take just a little short break for some announcements by the conference board and we'll see you all on the other side. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the conference board a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. All right. Welcome back. So I, I provoked you there a little bit before uh, the break for a little cliffhanger uh, uh, effect. So, so tell me your own success story, very much the kind of um, you know American dream from ditch digger to millionaire. Doesn't that actually frustrate people who are blue collar workers if they don't make it to the multimillionaire? No, it's, it's actually quite the opposite. You know, if, if this is why I, I get very involved and I think any mentor or any, any, um, any person who manages people should get deep into the goals that the people within that organization have. I, I think everyone's version of comfort, peace and freedom, which I talk about a lot in the book, I think everyone's version of that is different. And I use some examples of some people who are very, very happy, you know, making a, a six figure job and having all their bills paid and having the ability to recreate and not having a lot of stress and having a lot of freedom. You know, becoming successful like I have isn't the goal for everybody. In fact, I know a lot of people who are, are worth a lot of money who are miserable because they don't have the freedoms that that they wish that they did. So. The first thing that you need to do is you need to set your sights on exactly what would make you comfortable, peaceful, and financially free, and then go after that particular level. And it's different for everybody. I, I will say this, though. You don't have to be a business owner to do very well um, in the blue-collar world. I mean, if, if this continues, um, at least in, in our town, you're going to have Finnish carpenters and plumbers and electricians making more than family doctors. So you can build a great life without having any designs on becoming a quote unquote successful, uh, successful millionaire. Okay. All right. Now, as I read your book, uh, book, it, it, it came out a few months ago, you were talking about a strong economy, a lot of demand for people and products, a booming economy, economy that you say translates to a blue color boom, uh, as you call it. Uh, you know, where these jobs are in much demand. Uh, and in fact, you say white collar jobs seem kind of maxed out and many are shrinking. Many, many people are getting laid off in, the, in that segment. It, 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 it triggered two questions for me. Uh, let, let, let's go at one after the other. The first one is, um, aren't many of those blue collar opportunities today really part of the gig economy? Aren't they these very low paid gig jobs like Uber driver, DoorDash deliverer, Amazon warehouse that really do not allow you to lead a decent living as you just described? 
How do you look at the blue collar gig economy? Well, I, I guess that economy is going to stand on its own. I don't know what the number of that is in the 65 million overall total. But what I do look for is I do look for the, the, the bright spots that you can see. You know, um, in the Epoch Times this morning, they talked about um, the Institute for Supply Management said that U.S. manufacturing hit a 15-month high in July. Now, if you're a steel worker and you're trying to make a living in, in Northwest Ohio, you can walk in the door and make $90,000 doing that. Uh, I know that Fox Business put out a, a thing recently where D.R. Horton hit an all-time sales record in June of 2020. And that's during the pandemic. Those are people that build houses. And then it just keeps going from there. You know, one of the silver linings to this pandemic is the rediscovery of the family and, and the family home life. So now you're seeing, um, according to MarketWatch, you're seeing home improvement projects at unprecedented numbers. You know, lumber, nails, paint, stain, landscaping, uh, roofing, siding, and windows are all just going crazy. They can't keep this stuff on the shelves at, at your local big box stores. So somebody's doing something for somebody, and they're making a lot of money doing it. You know, you could continue with things like outdoor recreation, outdoor furniture sales through the roof. Um, the the uh, above and, and below ground pools, you're waiting one to two years to find one of those. Uh, bicycles, bicycle repairs, kayaks, camping equipment, anything recreation wise, really, really hot items now. Somebody has to make those. Somebody has to build those. Somebody has to sell those. So I just think that it may not be um, uh, it may not be a, a perfect scenario like you said for for everyone. And certainly, if you're an Uber driver in New York or, or a big city, you, you might be having some challenges right now. But I also know this: I, I know that people are tough, people are resilient, and you know you may have to um, rethink some of your careers, which is part of why I wrote Blue Collar Cash because if if you're either a, a guy at a desk job and you just don't like your job or um, if you're, you know, um, thinking about um, changing your 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 job mid career and going into something where you can use your hands and you're much more passionate about, you know, you can you can find ways in this book to make that happen to uh, gain, you know, a life that you never even thought about before. Mm, that makes sense. I mean, again, um, others talk about pivot, right, and use that as a word to. You know, if, if you think you're going around the, the, down the wrong path, whether it's as a business or an individual, try to pivot and find something. I guess you almost answered the second question that, you know, came to my mind, which is in this pandemic and post-pandemic time, it seems that a lot of the blue color work is considered essential, which is great. People are thankful, you know, the nurses, the uh, people who um, uh, work in, in waste management, uh, you know, policemen, etc. But on the other hand, you also hear about that not translating to any, any higher payments to, you know, compensate for that increased risk for these, another expression is frontline workers. How do you see that? And how do you see this going forward? Does the future look bright for blue collar jobs or What's your perspective over the next 10 years? Well, I just look at past uh, history as my best teacher. And if we continue to raise our kids in a way where they're inside the house, you know, nose into the computer, um, into their, um, their phones and, and their tablets, we're going to continue to have people who don't know how to properly use a tool don't know how to properly do things around the house, don't know how to build something in their yard. So I, I just think that's going to continue. And, uh, you know, unless and until um, shop class comes back to some of our high schools, I think we're still going to have this scenario where, you know, there is this huge crisis of, of, of needed workers to do some of these tasks. And uh, I, I think that's going to go on at least for the next Decade now, I, I realize that some high schools are bringing back the you know the shop class because they recognize what's happening. I know a lot of big box stores are going right into the high schools to try to get some of those kids um, to consider their their jobs and their careers. I know that um, apprenticeships are, are starting to blossom, 
And I, I just think that that trend is going to continue. You know, I, I look at it again this way. There, there's one thing that a blue collar job has that maybe a, a white collar or a desk job doesn't have. And, and that is that, um, that ability, that step back moment where, you know, you, you're, you're done building this outdoor kitchen for somebody. It's beautiful. You get to charge a really good amount of money for it because, you know, they've been waiting for you for six months or a year and you, you know that your business is sound and you have the demand. So you get to step back from that, that beautiful kitchen and you get to look at that and say to yourself, wow, I built that with my own two hands. I, I created something that's going to withstand the test of time. You know, that thing will be there 50, 60, hopefully 100 years from now. And I just don't think you get some of that satisfaction in some of these jobs that, you know, are, are more inside and, and you don't really see the end game of what you're doing. That makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly to those who've worked in an office for a long time, I guess. Um, time is flying. We're, we're running out, but this has been really interesting. Before we go, I, you have lots of interesting examples in your book. Um, two questions on that. What is one or two of the ones that you found the most surprising? You already talked about the lady and the gravel transportation business. And, and second, are those the people who read your book? Who is reading your book? Who is it written for? And who do you find out is actually reading your book? Well, first, yeah, I, I think I think some of the midlife career changes were the most surprising. You know, people who went from uh, waitressing to owning their own bakery, people who were in med school who dropped out to become a YouTube influencer and now are hugely successful, people who um, perhaps, uh, um, you know, again the whole the whole gravel truck scenario, which which I, I think is just amazing. The, the welder, um, you know, in in the welder's case. All she wanted to do was complete her two-year degree so she could get on with her life. And she took a welding class as an elective and basically got rid of everything that she had been studying for and got a job right out of the school and now is making you know more than 150000 a year. So there's just some amazing things that have happened in my research. But I, I think the most important thing we're, that we're discovering is, you know, this book is great for a parent or grandparent, aunt or uncle or, or a mentor who has someone in their, their life that needs maybe some guidance. And I think they should both read it so that they can have a good conversation as to the options they have for that person's future. But then I was finding out that business owners, you know, general managers, anybody who's hiring somebody, this book can really help you build some amazingly loyal team members. Um, because they become entrepreneurial employees within your own organization, which I think is very, very important. Because I think, I think until your employees get what they want first, your, your company um, doesn't get what it wants or needs. And I, I'm a very firm believer in that. I, I also know that um, if you're one of those people who you, you're just stuck, and you know it doesn't matter whether you're whether you're 18 or 50, you're just kind of stuck and you can't figure out how to get yourself to to visualize what the rest of your life is going to look like. I, I think I think you can finally get some momentum going if you read some of the ways that we talk about setting goals and uh, and and seeing what your best life can be and then going after it one piece at a time. I think you whetted some appetites there. So if people want to find out more about Blue Collar Cash and uh, about what you do. I think you also do workshops and, and other things. What's the easiest way to access that information? Where should they go? Well, they should go to bluecollarcash.com. Um, and if they want to see what I'm up to as far as uh, the, the content, they can go to kenrusk.com. But the book is for sale everywhere uh, books are sold. It's you know Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, Indie Books, Apple Books, um, all those places you can get it. There you go. Excellent. Thanks so much again, Ken, for coming on the show. This was uh, interesting. Interesting also to see a lot of the parallels actually between what we talk about when we talk blue color jobs versus white color jobs. Um, and you, dear listener, thank you for tuning in. If you found this episode helpful, then don't be shy. Let us know through your comments, ratings, of course, sign up subscribe, tell your neighbors, friends, colleagues about it, um, and discover all the other uh, podcasts that we have beyond Off the Shelf. You can find those at conference-board.org forward slash 
podcast. And with that, thanks again, um, Ken, for being on the show and uh, talk to you all soon.